And one of the reasons why, of course, we need to keep the Earth below one and a half degrees is because the paleoclimate um, history of our planet, particularly looking at past sea levels, tells us what sea level does when ice sheets melt and how high does it go uh, when, when different ice sheets of different sizes or combinations of ice sheets uh, do collapse uh, during glacial, interglacial times. And so we can use the elevation of these sea levels and the conditions to, to then look at what the conditions might be like as we go forward. And as you can, as you can see here, here we're talking about uh, at one degree, um, we're already facing at least two to three meters of sea level rise are baked into our, um, into our system. Sea level is rising and that is not reversible. I can't emphasize that enough. We're not going to be able to grow these ice sheets back anytime soon. If we go back to the, what we call the Eemian, if it's a, a in, in the glacial interglacial cycles, the last time it was as warm as it is today for about 10,000 years, we call that the Eemian. And during that period, um, sea level was in the range of six to nine meters above present. And that was at a temperature of about one and a half degree. So again, we're already kind of there or approaching it. And so we're already baking in to the system um, uh, serious sea level rise um, in, our, in our coming decades and centuries because we've already got that baked into the system. And so what melted, we think, uh, working with ice sheet scientists, that at least two to three meters of that total came from the melt of Greenland, and the rest of it probably came from the West Antarctic ice sheet, that for the most part. But you can also see that if we go back in time, even to the Pliocene about three million years ago, um, when there was, at that time, no West Antarctic ice sheet, and the Greenland ice sheet was much, much smaller, we had sea levels in the range of about 20 meters. And this has actually been several papers that come, have come out in the last couple of years that really make that number pretty strong, about 20 meters of sea level. So that means um, that's a lot of ice. And of course, if we go anything higher than that, um, we're really facing um, approaching an ice-free uh, conditions. And the other thing, so the question is not how much but how fast and how much we're committed to this. Of course, as I said, it's not reversible. Um, and we know from an event about 14,000 years ago that ice sheets of these large size can collapse quickly. And there's a period of time at about, about 14,000 years ago when sea level rose dramatically in just a few, about four or 500 years. So we know that the ice sheets are capable of this type of rapid collapse. Here is an idea uh, of what the Greenland ice sheet may look like by 2023. Um, so, um, so this fits with predictions, particularly in areas of heavy melt uh, that we see today with looking at forecasting out into the future um, what, um, what these ice sheets will do. Will they melt? Uh, dramatically fast like um, in a in a few years no um, in fact uh, it's not part of this presentation but papers have come out recently to suggest that business as usual RCP 8.5 this ice, the entire Greenland ice sheet could be gone in less than a thousand years okay so by the year 3000 that's okay so that's that's not 3000 years from now but by the year 3000 so we're getting better at trying to predict what these temperatures will do. So, of course, part of the sea level rise is kind of going to be coming from Antarctica. There's a lot of research being done, particularly on uh, ice sheet stability. Uh, we can forecast here in this paper, uh, possibly as much as um, uh, 30 to 40 centimeters, maybe a half a meter from Antarctica by 2100. And after that time, particularly if we don't do anything about, um, about CO2, if we stay business as usual, sometime around um, 2060, by that time we're bifurcating away from and driving the system of, the, of many of these ice sheets, particularly the ice shelves, um, that may put us on a path to much rapid 
more rapid high sea level because of the loss of the buttressing power of, of the ice shell. So this, this is why now, what we do now, there's a role for policy to determine which track we're on with these pa different pathways. I mentioned these ice shelves. All of these areas in red that are on this particular figure, they are th floating ice. They can be as much as 400 meters thick, but they're floating, but they're buttressing, they're holding back the ice. And if they collapse, um, they then release all of the ice behind. We, and we've seen this happen more recently in up, up the, Ana, um, uh, uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. Seven of the 10 ice shelves in that area have all collapsed in the last few decades. And we immediately see, we can see particularly with remote sensing, very rapid increase in the flow of the ice that's on land into the sea, which of course is going to rise sea level. Um, and so current concerns are in that red box in the, in the Pine Island Thwaites Glacier region where we've seen tremendous melt of the ice shelves there, both from the bottom, from warm water, from the circumantarctic current getting up under those shelves in ways that we had not ever observed before, as well as uh, melt happening on the surface. So this part of West Antarctica is um, warming up Whereas other parts of Antarctica, you might argue it's not feeling a thing about global warming, but this area is. So some people have suggested that we've already reached the tipping point, that we're, we've already at a point of no return with the collapse of some of these ice shelves. So what are the consequences for sea level then? Well, um, let's think about that. This is a, um, a, a website from Climate Central. There's a poster from them here on the back of the wall uh, that where it takes different uh, coastal cities and increases sea level. You can actually go into this website yourself and play around with a toggle and look for your favorite coastal area and see what happens with a meter or two meters. So here, here is a uh, change in, in uh, elevation of sea level by about three meters. And so you can pick out your favorite place here in the UK. Here it is at 20 meters. This, is, this would be a Pliocene shoreline from 3 million years ago. And here we go London. And here we come into, we can increase here at, at 10 meters in London, 20 meters in London. And then of course, um, we can come up here to Glasgow. Here's Glasgow at 20 meters. So that's a Pliocene world. Um, and I just want to mention, in the Pliocene, the atmosphere was already at four, over 400 parts per mil CO2. So we're in a Pliocene atmosphere right now already. We're driving the planet toward a Pliocene. So um, my last slide is just to show you again what happens now directs and has a, has a very important role for policy in terms of the trajectory we're going to be on for sea level. So I'll, I think I'll leave it at that and go on to the next slide. Well, at this COP, um, flexibility is the name of the game. The presenter for this is over there briefing the Swiss Minister of Environment. I'm not going to pull her away from that. Instead, I am going to, but she's a treat to listen to, so I'm simply going to scroll ahead and then we'll come back to her once she's done. Because I know the Swiss Minister is very busy and so it's certainly not going to take the, the period of time of the rest of this event. So if you will bear with us. Okay. This is Arctic sea ice, and this is a presentation that Julianne Strove or Dirk Knotts or Walt Meyer normally would give. Um, and of course, there's been a huge change in the extent of Arctic sea ice already at today's 1.2 degrees. Uh, loss of about 40%, but even more so, there's been a thickness loss in Arctic sea ice. That's in some ways the most important because with that volume of ice gone, a lot of species are very dependent on it. And with the release of AR6, the ice community, the sea ice community, you might have noticed that there wasn't a whole lot in the summary for policymakers if you read that. That's because from their point of view, this is what I was told by them, 
that uh, Arctic sea ice is essentially already tipped into a new state. Uh, it is very thin, and their only real conclusion in the SPM was simply that sometime between now and 2050, no matter what emission scenario we follow, there will be at least one ice-free summer. And with that ice-free summer will be, you know, a, a very large change in, in the ecosystem, in its ability to bounce back. Um, this is also an important aspect of Arctic sea ice loss. It's a very busy slide, of course, but what you see here going from left to right, 1980 to 2020, are periods of um, more or less ice than the average between 1981 and 2010. And as you can see, for all months of the year, we have less sea ice. So there's a lot of focus every year on the September minimum when the sea ice normally reaches its lowest minimum extent. But part of the news is that year round, it's actually setting records. Uh, last year, although the actual minimum was not a record, the sea ice actually was at record minimums almost every other month of the year. And then it had a period of recovery. Uh, very straight tracking with CO2 emissions and temperature. And this is an interesting slide. I love the way Julianne did this. I'm going to step over into here now. But uh, what you see here are the periods in the different months of the year on the left where it's ice covered and ice free. The threshold of temperature for no summer sea ice, or excuse me, yeah, no summer sea ice at every single year is about 1.7 degrees. We'll have occasional ice-free years even at 1.5 degrees, but by 1.7 every September, there will be a few days or weeks of ice-free conditions in the Arctic. And then as, if it gets warmer still, then there will be longer periods where the Arctic Ocean is essentially ice-free. Um, that's going to have implications for all sorts of, of portions of the Earth's system. It affects Greenland ice sheet melt, it affects the degree of permafrost melt, and then just overall albedo of the cooling of the Earth. Um, And if we're at three degrees, then you're looking at a really long period when the Arctic is ice free. Uh, and again, the longer that gets, the more extreme conditions as a result of that. And we're really not sure because we've never lived as humans in a world that has an ice-free Arctic, especially for that much of the year. And in model project projections, uh, these are the new SSPs. In other words, the, what we call over here very low, low emissions, uh, intermediate and high. You see this decrease, but in September, on the left-hand graph, a lot of that decrease has already occurred. What we see in the future with high emissions is you see an equally extreme decrease then in March, which is the maximum for summer sea ice. And volume is going down just as much, or if not more, than area. And this is important for the Arctic ecosystem because you need to think of sea ice. It's not just you know ice sitting there. It's very thick, or at least it has been. It's not so long ago that a fairly substantial portion of Arctic sea ice was more than 10 years old. So this was really, really thick ice. It was like a coral reef would be uh, in the rest of the world. Organisms live there, they depend on it. And without that, the ecosystem undergoes a basic state change, which has already occurred. And this is just a representation of one potential implication. There was a side event focused on this of Arctic sea ice loss where you have a much weaker jet stream the winds, the polar uh, vortex, as people like to call it, are able to break out of the Arctic. And you get cold periods that last for a period of time, or you get warm periods. You get very, very odd weather systems that are persistent over a long period of time that we have not seen, at least before, in the record. They're, they're occurring more and more often. This is one of the more controversial aspects of sea ice loss, 
very determined camps on both sides, but I think a lot of people have noticed weather, weather differences. And a good way to think about this is Arctic sea ice is associated with the warming Arctic. These kinds of weather patterns are also associated with the warming Arctic. And the real message is that with the warmer Arctic, you get much less of a temperature gradient between the mid-latitudes, where Glasgow is, for example, and higher latitudes, and that's why you're getting these disturbances in the jet stream. And this is just some pictures of what's happened in the past. We move on now to uh, the polar oceans. And there's a lot of attention at this COP to the oceans. Our focus is the polar oceans because they're different in many ways. They are warming faster than the other oceans. They are freshening at the same time because of the massive amounts of ice that are pouring off of uh, Greenland and Antarctica, glaciers as well as the ice sheets. And most importantly, perhaps, in terms of a kind of permanent state change is acidification. Colder waters absorb CO2 much more readily than uh, warmer waters, and so they're acidifying much more quickly than the mid-latitude and the tropical oceans. Uh, so we're going to see acidification sooner. You could say that the polar oceans are performing an ecosystem service for the planet because they're one of the reasons that we're only at 420 parts per million now in terms of CO2 concentrations. By some estimates, the two polar oceans have absorbed about 60% of the CO2 that's been absorbed by the world's oceans. And this is the difference that we'll see between low and high emissions. So low, very low emissions is the lower globe. That's a 1.5 uh, degree C world staying about at 450 ppm or below, you're still seeing a fair amount of acidification over Canada and Siberia. But if we go into high emissions mode with very high levels of CO2, then we will end up with that world on the top where in essence shell building organisms will not be able to build and maintain their shells. Again, completely changing the ecosystem. And this is some shell damage that has been observed already. Uh, these pictures were taken from uh, samples that were taken at about 410 ppm, around 2010. So we were seeing shell damage in some portions of the Arctic and Southern Oceans already at that point. And the key thing to think about is that acidification has a really long tail. I mean, the, the, uh, you, everybody knows that CO2 lasts a long time in the atmosphere. It lasts even longer in the water. So for the ocean to buffer out and to come back up to the pH where it is today will take 50 to 70,000 years. Obviously, species can't wait around that long. And so this is really perhaps the, the longest threshold behavior that we see on the planet. And this is one of the reasons, as we say, why SRM, solar radiation management, as you heard earlier today, really is not a viable idea because if, you know, that, that might mask warming by reflecting uh, back, you know, some of the sun's rays back into space, but at the same time, CO2 continues rising and the oceans will continue absorbing it. And again, with that 50 to 70,000 year tail. Uh, so this shows that just, you know, graphically, even by 2500, especially with very high emissions, you're just getting started to buffer that out. So this is an example then, practical terms for a lot of humans with cod. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of this section, you're getting a lot of freshening and warming. You're also getting uh, incursion of invasive species from the south, right? The mid-latitude species are moving north. At the same time, you have warmer, fresher, more acidic waters moving from the south. And so what's happening to northern species like cod is that they're getting sandwiched between these bands, and there's eventually nowhere left for them to go. So unfortunately, we're probably seeing a, a situation where, especially with very high emissions, current wild living species such as cod and salmon are going to have a very hard time surviving uh, in this new Arctic and northern oceans, places like the North Sea, the Barents Sea, because of the changes in the ecosystem.
So I'm going to back up here and try to get, I saw that Heidi, I believe, was done. Amy, could you get Heidi over here while I back up to glaciers? Thank you for having me to talk about my favorite topic and the state of the Chrysphere report on the chapter that is focusing on uh, mountain glaciers and snow. Thank you. So what about these mountain glaciers? We are tightly connected to all these mountain glaciers, whether they are in the Himalayas, in the Alps, uh, all along the Andes. These glaciers play a very big importance on societies. They cover only a very small portion of the land masses on Earth. As you can see here, about 0.5% of all land ice is actually locked into these mountain glaciers. So here, I'm, I am actually ignoring the big ice sheets that are Greenland and Antarctica, only focusing on the mountain glaciers. These mountain glaciers, no matter how small they are, they were actually the largest contributors to sea level rise during the 20th century. So they are important, they play a capital role on sea level rise. We know that these mountain glaciers have a really big importance on the surrounding areas we, we find them. And for example, I'm from the French Alps and we love our mountain glaciers. They have a big importance on our local economies. But also the meltwater coming from these mountain glaciers has an importance all along the rivers that are connected to these glaciers. So their importance, their influence is felt over hundreds and thousands of kilometers away from those mountain ranges. So why should we care? Why do we need to care so much about these mountain glaciers and also the snow falling on these beautiful mountain ranges? First of all, because of the water they provide. When the snow melts every spring, when glaciers lose mass every summer, they provide a lot of fresh water. And this fresh water can be used for drinking, can be used for sanitation, for irrigation, for the production of hydroelectricity. In my region, again, this water coming from the glaciers is also being used to cool down nuclear power plants. So that's very important. We do need the meltwater coming from these glaciers and also from the snow. We know that in the vulnerable regions, such as the tropics, for example, there are still glaciers in the tropics. The meltwater coming from the melting snow and ice is of huge importance during the dry seasons. So this is when the importance of the snowpack and of the glaciers is felt the most. We have some regions like in the US, for example, in the western US, western continental US, the melting snow also provides a very big resource of fresh water. And we know that when the snow melts more and more every year, when the glaciers lose more and more mass, it creates a range of consequences. It can create hazards, natural hazards. We have um, mountains that are being destabilized, slope instability that is felt very strongly. This also impacts local economies. If you think about recreational winter activities directly connected to the presence of snow and ice, they are suffering tremendously from the loss of snow and ice. When these mountain glaciers are lost, when they disappear, we also lose with them these incredible climate archives. You know when we go to these mountains and collect ice cores? These ice cores tell us so much about past climate changes. When the glaciers are gone, we lose this very precious information. And finally, if you look at these mountain communities living around these glaciers, there is a lot of traditions, there is a, a cultures that have been created around these glaciers that are being lost when the glaciers disappear. So now I will go through different regions and we're going to look at the future. Together we're going to look at these projections all the way to the year 2300 and see what would happen to the glaciers in these different regions depending 
on some of the decisions that are going to be made here at COP26. And the different scenarios are represented in different colors. In the blue color, this is the very low and low emission scenarios. In the orange color here, we're looking at the middle of the road scenario. And in red, this is business as usual. These are the high emission scenarios. And what you can see here on the diagram is the change in mass of the glaciers in these different regions. And here we're starting with the tropics, because there are still glaciers in the tropics. We call them tropical glaciers, and they're found in the northern Andes. We have glaciers left in Mexico, for example, glaciers in Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador. We have glaciers in East Africa. We still have glaciers in Papua New Guinea. I mean, you might have not heard about them, but there's still some ice there. And we do know that for these tropical glaciers, an increase in temperature of plus one degree is already too much. Today, it is almost too late to save most of the tropical glaciers. If we follow even a 1.5 degree scenario, by the end of the century, only the glaciers at very high elevations above 6,000 meters will survive. All the glaciers in East Africa, Indonesia will be gone by the end of the century. So plus one is already too much for these glaciers. If we move to mid-latitude glaciers, so the beautiful glaciers of the French Alps are there. For example, we have Scandinavia, Caucasus, Western Canada, US, Southern Andes and New Zealand. There we start to see massive differences on, based on the different scenarios. If we were to follow business as usual, the high emission scenarios, we could lose most of these glaciers by the end of the century. But if you look at the scenarios in blue, look at the huge differences it would make to follow the low and very low emission scenarios. We could keep a very large proportion of these glaciers by the end of the century. And it's very important to look beyond the end of the century because climate change obviously doesn't stop by 2300. And if we look at Central Europe, which is at the bottom right corner of the screen here, if we were to follow a 1.5 degree compatible scenario, not only we could keep about 40% of the ice mass we have in Central Europe today by 2100, but we could even get a slow regrowth of the glaciers if we look beyond 2100. So the differences are huge, especially if we're able to follow 1.5 degree compatible scenario. Now I'm going to move to the high altitude and high latitude glaciers. So the regions we're looking at are the Himalayas and also Arctic Canada. And here again, the differences between scenarios are absolutely massive. If we were to continue business as usual, if you look at the red curves, by 2300, we would lose so much of these glaciers. Especially look at the Himalayas, which are the diagrams on the left hand side here. More than a billion people in the Himalayas, in India, in all the countries surrounding the Himalayas depend upon the water from the Himalayan glaciers. And if we were to follow business as usual, we could lose such a large portion of the glaciers in the Himalayas. But again, a 1.5 degree scenario is the only way, this is the only way we can keep as much of these glaciers as possible. And I will finish this presentation on this chapter on mountain glaciers and snow with the snow. Snow plays an even bigger role in bringing all these uh, water resources to the people living around these mountain ranges and all along the rivers coming from these mountain ranges. We know today that snow, the snowpack is suffering from the increase in temperature. The presence and the persistence of snow is changing all around the world and also the precipitation patterns are being affected by climate change. We know that snow arrives later in the seasons, melts earlier. We know that the, the snowpack is thinning and the area covered by the snow is also being reduced more and more every year. And this snow is extremely important. When it falls on the ground, it acts like a blanket protecting the soil underneath. We know that when the snow melts, it irrigates the soil, protecting the soil from being completely dry in the summer, protecting the soil from wildfires, for example. And of course, especially here in Scotland, we know that more than 600 people depend upon the snow for all the winter recreational activities. This employs 600 people in Scotland, so we still need very much the snow here in the country. And I think it shows the importance of the cryosphere in Scotland, in Glasgow, while we are 
assisting at the northernmost COP that is the closest to the Arctic but also directly connected to, to this snowpack. Thank you. I think this was my last slide. Thank you very much. So I'm going to click ahead to Gustav Ugelius, uh, our final dynamic, uh, which is permafrost. And Gustav is part of the International uh, Permafrost Network. Uh, and this is a picture of a cliff formation, abrupt thaw, which is actually one of his areas of very, very active research. I'll get a bit back into that later. But uh, basically what happens with permafrost when it thaws is that it releases carbon that's been stored for thousands of years, if not more. Uh, it releases it as CO2 under dry conditions, as methane under wet conditions. And so that's why you'll hear permafrost scientists talk about carbon release rather than trying to specify because it's really very specific. And permafrost loss is ongoing. Uh, to date at, you know, 1, 1.2 degrees C, this is the extent of near surface permafrost loss. So this is permafrost in the first few meters of the soil. And you can see how rapidly it's thawing. I'm going to go back just so you can see this again. So it's a really rapid loss. Um, and this is important globally because it decreases the carbon budget available to humans. Um, at 1.5 degrees C, you see that permafrost is still releasing a fairly substantial proportion of the carbon budget that is left. Permafrost emissions today are on the order of about the size of Japan. Uh, and they will increase the warmer it gets. Uh, at two degrees, there's a little bit more uh, permafrost emissions, a lot more human emissions. There's actually quite a bit of a difference between 1.5 and 2. Um, but the scale of emissions really depends on peak temperature and even more so, and this is really difficult with permafrost, you can get a permafrost thaw in a heat wave. Uh, and we've seen lots of heat waves in the Arctic. And so this may actually be an underestimate of the degree of permafrost thaw we're going to see. But these, these um, permafrost emissions are really hard to capture in global models. And so even in AR6, in this new CIMIP6 models that are, that are being used to project climate in the future and the behavior of the, the planet and the global climate system, these emissions are not actually included. They're sort of, there's a footnote, there's a bit of an estimate, but in terms of really, you know, quantifying how much it's going to be, still it's the case that climate modelers at least don't want to include it. Permafrost modelers really think they should. And so it's, it's an area of very active debate, let's say. Um, but the other important thing with permafrost is that the emissions continue for centuries after the initial thaw. So I'll step over here in a second, but this is really important. This is again a matter of intergenerational justice because you get a certain amount of emissions to 2100 but that permafrost continues emitting for a couple of hundred years. So if you look at the blue bar at 1.5 degrees C, you see the median emissions, but the multi-century is much higher. Same for two degrees C, and at four degrees C, it's even greater. In other words, what that's saying is that, suppose we do reach net zero emissions by 2050. Permafrost is going to continue emitting for at least a couple of centuries after that. So in addition to the negative emissions that are in the models to keep pet temperature below 1.5 degrees C, we also have to have emissions to offset, or negative emissions to offset permafrost. And we're going to have to continue doing that for a couple of hundred years until the permafrost stabilizes, it's lost all of its carbon, and then, you know, then we can truly have net zero, but net zero in a sense is not net zero until permafrost emissions are complete. So even if we bring temperatures down again, if this is permafrost that refreezes, it actually continues emitting very, very slowly. So we always try and end this with a bit of a moment of hope and the 1.5 degree report as well as we think working group three 
an AR6, which will come out in March of next year. 1.5 degrees still is within reach, but it does require rapid, far-reaching changes on an unprecedented scale. And it needs to be happening this decade, and that's why there's so much of an emphasis on now to 2030. That's why we've decided to release the State of the Cryosphere report every single year between now and 2030, both to take the pulse of the cryosphere and update on the latest science. And like these Toblerones do, if we did these today, we would say these optimistic NDCs, for example, that you see on, on the side that most of you are seeing towards me, uh, optimistic NDCs, all of the pledges, you say everybody's going to say what they say they're going to say, even if they haven't put laws in place or any steps at all to, to make it happen. Peak now would be 1.8 degrees is what we're hearing in terms of the pledges that have come at this COP. But we have to pay attention to what countries are actually doing. Those are the other sides of those Toblers. And we need to see that happening about 50% globally by 2030. It's very important for policymakers, but even more so the general public, to understand if we do not decrease globally 50% emissions by 2030, then we will not reach net zero by 2050. It will no longer be physically or economically feasible to do so. That was in the 1.5 degree report. It was extremely clear. And so far, emissions continue to rise. So we're not there yet. And it's really important that governments understand the urgency. Uh, all stakeholders need to, but really this is a massive change, right? In energy lands, transport and infrastructure, industry, all stakeholders need to be a part of that. But these are the kinds of things really that only large governments can do and make happen. And this is what those emissions reductions will look like. You have this very, very steep decline between 2020 and 2030 in the sectors where we know we're able to do this, which is primarily transport and energy. And then the net zero is those sectors that are a little bit more difficult, right? Industry, uh, steel making, for example, other kinds of industries that are both carbon intensive, but you know, steel cement emits CO2 even in the process of making it happen. And also things like agriculture, where you have a lot of emissions, for example, from livestock. Those are the ones that we really don't know how to do right now or we can't do at scale. That's between 2030 and 2050. And then negative emissions, carbon drawdown for the rest of the century to stay below 1.5 degrees. So are these changes still feasible? Uh, the special report said yes. Geophysically, in other words, the physical reality, yes. Environmentally feasible, we can do it and still protect the environment. Lots on nature-based solutions, for example, here. Uh, technologically, we have the technology to make it happen. We really don't need new technology. And it's economically not just feasible but advantageous because we're not ha suffering the loss and damage that we will at temperatures above 1.5 degrees. What's left is institutional and social cultural feasibility, and that's up to us. That's what we need to decide at this COP and going forward over this next decade. So I'm going back a bit to uh, Julie's presentation just to put us on this time scale, right? Uh, glaciers, interglacials for a long time, and now we are really off the chart. And we need to bring it down again if we want to stay at safe levels. So what you'll see in the State of the Cryosphere report over and over again, there's no negotiating with the melting point of ice. Uh, these are essentially permanent with the exception of Arctic sea ice, which can come back in decades or maybe, you know, it could take as long as a century, depending on how warm the oceans get. But in terms of glaciers and snow, 300, 500, maybe 1,000 years to restore a glacier. Ice sheets are e an even longer time. Uh, we will get extreme sea level rise if we stay above 2 degrees C for any long period of time. Permafrost, I mean, once permafrost thaws, for new permafrost to form takes many, many centuries, if not thousands of years. And polar ocean acidification, in many ways, the longest 50 to 70,000 years. But the level of risk and damage from cryosphere to the globe is really dependent on peak temperature. And it's really important to understand that. It's not good enough for the cryosphere if we go up and come down again. It will continue responding to whatever peak temperature was. Every tenth of a degree counts. At COP26, 
Uh, one of the things that a number of especially mountain countries with glaciers and snow are focusing on, but also those concerned by the cryosphere, uh, there is a desire to bring cryosphere dynamics more explicitly into the negotiations, because this is really complex science. This is a gallop through the science, and when it's been addressed at past UNFCC meetings, it's usually been one presentation of 10 to 15 minutes, if that with maybe five to 10 minutes for questions. That's not enough time for policymakers to absorb this. So there's a real need to take the time. These are called dialogues, they're normally a full day, or you can do a workshop for maybe a half a day, but regardless, in at, at COP25, when the COP accepted the special report on lands and the special report on oceans and cryosphere, there were dialogues mandated on lands and on oceans. The COP was entirely silent on cryosphere. And unfortunately, so far, this COP is too. Um, so there's a need to consider these disparate elements and what their thresholds are. Arctic sea ice, the 1.7 degree threshold. Permafrost emissions, they're ongoing and increasing. There will come a point where there's very little permafrost, at least subseas, uh, uh, near surface permafrost left. Uh, glacier snowpack related water resource loss is ongoing. As Heidi mentioned, we've already lost many tropical glaciers and mid-latitude glaciers, but the threshold there lies between one degree for most tropical glaciers. By about 2.5 degrees, almost all glaciers in the world are gone. And again, it takes a very long time for them to come back. Ice sheets and sea level rise, real threshold behavior between one and two degrees C. And ocean acidification, most, I would say, ocean acidification experts think that for the polar oceans, there's a real threshold right around 450, which is about 1.5 degree. So all of these are tied to CO2 emissions, tied to our carbon budget, tied to peak temperature, and that has clear implications for a Paris Agreement and UNFCCC processes uh, that are tied to temperature like the second periodic review and the global stock take. And so this science really needs to feed into that in a major way, and right now there's no way to make that happen except by maybe references to AR6, but again, a real deep discussion of this has not taken place at any COP or at any bond meeting. Bonds are the intercessionals. And the cryosphere science community really believes that needs to happen so that parties have a better idea when they're doing the second periodic review of the long-term temperature goal. When they're doing the global stock take aimed now at, we're already on our way to 2025, right? These need to be taken into account. And that's why there's a desire to have as part of the COP26 cover decision uh, to mention cryosphere, because right now it isn't anywhere. The word does not appear in the cover text. And to ask for a cryosphere dialogue workshop, something. Much as has happened with oceans, but this is a little bit different. It's a narrower process to feed into these two things, the second periodic review and the global stock take. Um, finally, you know, to end with a bit of hope, we do have something called the 50 by 30 coalition. It is those governments and also those scientific institutions that are really concerned about this and that currently have 50 by 30 consistent goals. Um, and actual measures to implement them. Very few countries do. Most of the Nordics, Germany, the UK, Scotland joined last week. Uh, so they have 1.5 consistent policies if they fully implement them. Now I've got to say this doesn't take equity into account, but all we're focused on right now is just the physical reality. And the reason we're doing this is to make it clear that this isn't impossible because sometimes there's a lot of defeatist talk, but there are governments that are taking the steps they need to. They need to do more, but the rest of the world needs to do even more. So you'll find the full report of the state of the cryosphere online. There's a QR code. Unfortunately, I think we're out of all our paper copies, um, but we're all here, Heidi, Julie, and I, to uh, answer questions as we can. And so we'll open it up to questions on any of these dynamics, anything having to do with um, the role of cryosphere in COP26 and ongoing. So Heidi and Julie, if you want to come up here. Are there any questions? You'll have to, you'll have to come to the microphone. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Roberta Benefiel and I'm with uh, Grand River Keeper Labrador um, from Labrador. We've been doing some research and I, I understand that all of your presentation has been about what is happening. My question is why it's happening. Is it all about CO2 or could it be possible that some of these, uh, uh, like the ocean acidification and ocean temperature rise and melting ice sheets could be due, and we have some documents that say that this is true, could it be due to all of these massive hydro dams in Russia and Canada?